Hi, my name is Annie Grossman, and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. This week's episode of School for the Dogs podcast is brought to you by SaneBox. SaneBox is basically EMT for your email. As messages flow in, SaneBox does the triage for you, sifting only the important emails into your inbox and directing all the other distracting stuff into your Sane later folder. It's awesome. I love it. I use it so that I know what messages I really need to pay attention to now and what stuff I can get to later on. It also has nifty features like a sane black hole where you can drag messages from annoying senders you never want to hear from again and sane reminders to ping you if someone hasn't replied to your email by a certain date. Best of all, you can use SaneBox with any email client or phone anywhere you check your email. See how SaneBox can truly magically remove distractions from your inbox with a two-week free trial and $15 off at schoolforthedogs.com slash sane. Now have you heard the latest of the bully of the town? He went up late last evening and he shot his woman down. That's why I'm So, you know you're a pretty big dog-loving nerd if you can get very excited about bully stick holders. And uh, I'll explain later in this episode exactly what a bully stick is, if you're not familiar with bully sticks. But basically, they're a very popular kind of dog chew. I recommend them to clients all the time because they're a single ingredient and dogs love them. Lots of great things about bully sticks. But one downside to bully sticks is when they get to their very last inch or so, they kind of look like cigars, uh, depending on the size that you get. But when they get down to that little nub, there's always the risk that a dog can swallow it, which uh, is never a good thing. So over the last few years, a couple companies have started offering various kinds of bully stick holders, basically devices that keep your dog from being able to get to that last little bit. And at School for the Dogs, we get really thrilled when we receive one of these things to try uh, because, like I said, we recommend bully sticks all the time. So right now at storeforthedogs.com, we sell three. and. Each one kind of has a different approach to solving this problem. Uh, probably our most popular one is called the Anima Swizzler. It's this very cool looking kind of like plastic and rubber cage that fits over a bully stick. And uh, we sell a lot of these, I like them, but they're not really great for super heavy chewers because uh, plastic and rubber can be broken and uh, sometimes the dogs do end up breaking them. So I don't recommend them for heavy chewers. Then we have one made by the company Westpaw, which is a really great company. It's all rubber and you kind of shove the bully stick in. It kind of looks like a really big uh, hot dog bun. Um, and that also has its advantages and uh, disadvantages. I think the main disadvantage is most of the bully stick is lodged in the rubber thing, so your dog really can't get to it at all. And um, then the third one, which we've recently started selling, is called the Bonehead. And it's kind of like a clamp that literally screws onto a bully stick with a screwdriver. And it's pretty cool, but it was actually designed really to be used with Himalayan chews, which are a little larger and more square than a bully stick. Uh, you can use it with a bully stick, but uh, I find it's not ideal. So recently, I received in the mail this very different kind of bully stick holder that was unlike any other bully stick holder I'd ever seen, mostly in that you had to use it with bully sticks that had a hole drilled into them. So I wasn't sure what to think of this. I left it at the studio for some of the trainers to try out during our day school program. And oh my God, the trainers loved it. They said that the dogs who normally destroy all the other holders we have 
could not hack it at all. So I called the guy who sent it to us and I said, hey, can we buy a bunch of these? I'd love to sell them in our shop. And he said, no. Turns out I had received one of only about a dozen prototypes that had been created that he is only beginning to manufacture these bully stick holders, which are called Ever Choose and uh, was about to launch a Kickstarter campaign. So I said, well, if I can't have the product now, maybe I can at least uh, have you on the podcast to let people know how cool this is. Uh, So this conversation is with the inventor of this toy, which I really hope will meet its Kickstarter goal. You can go see it on Kickstarter at everchew.com. That will bring you there uh, for the next few weeks at least. Um, And uh, I hope that you will be able to try with your dog sometime soon because from what I've seen with dogs and uh, from the experiences of my trainers, I think it really is a game changer. Last Friday night I called on him and he smiled at me and cussed. Then he grabbed his knife stick there, but my pistol got him first. Hey, bitter boy, that's the bully of the town. So, Kirby, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit how this, uh, interesting product came to be. Uh, my name is Kirby Kendall, and I am the inventor of the Everchew, which is a safety ring to keep dogs from choking on bully sticks and rawhide. So you sent us at School for the Dogs a prototype, I guess, of the Everchew a couple of weeks ago. And I have to say, we have had several different kinds of bully stick holders that we have experimented with at School for the Dogs. And uh, this was, I'd say, the one that has gotten the most rave reviews, <laughs> at least from our staff, which, uh, it, which is what led me to contact you because I wanted to carry them, and you said, not, not happening yet. Um, so, <laughs> so... I should say the bully stick holders that I've come across up until now, and maybe we should back up a little bit. Um, why why do you think there's a need for bully stick holders? And I guess for those who are listening who don't know what a bully stick is, maybe you can explain what a bully, a bully stick is since uh, I'm, I'm talking about them like it's something that everyone should know about. Yes, a lot of people don't know. Well, a bully stick is... Uh, Part of the cow that only comes from half of the cows, and specifically, it only comes from boy cows. <laughs> and uh, on the Facebook uh, post, everybody reverts to middle school mode, I think, and they start joking about uh, cow penises and stuff. Right. Much. A lot of people don't believe it when you tell them it's a cow penis, in my experience. Right. <laughs> right. And a lot of people are grossed out by that, but dogs adore them. Um, and we're using and, us- and we're using and we're using every part of the animal. I mean, it's a part of the animal that. We- yes, it's, mm-hmm. it is the whole nose to tail philosophy that uh, people are even trying to get into now. So, um, yes, it, it's good to use it, and uh, dogs adore it. It's good for their teeth. Um, my my middle school yeah. my middle school joke about it is you know what the original bully stick holder was called the cow vagina. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay <laughs> that's the worst right <laughs> yeah so bully sticks bully sticks are very popular with dogs um and uh they they i believe they're they're dried out they start out very very long some places in the world they make canes out of them from what i understand but yeah but usually they're cut up into pieces that are maybe six inches or a foot long, and uh, and dogs chew on them. So where does the need for a, uh, a holder come in? Well, it, it comes down to the whole, the last, oh, three-quarters inch of it or so after they've gnawed down to it. Um, I know my dog, she, she gets possessive of food and treats, like I guess most dogs do. And so if she gets low and she's uh, on a bully stick and, and it gets really short and you walk into the room, she thinks this human creature is going to steal this from me. I need to swallow it now. 
And so a couple of times she was doing that with rawhides, and I actually had to pull a segment of rawhide out of her throat. Um, but bully sticks do the same thing. And I've even had people uh, talking to about this. But <laughs> they've given their dogs a six-inch bully stick, and the dog has swallowed the whole thing in one go. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's what they're recording, which is astounding, right? But um, So the, the need comes from these things can get lodged in the trachea, uh, our esophagus, uh, I'm not medical enough to know <laughs> where it can get lodged, um, but it gets lodged in there, and uh, I suppose they could die if it, if it blocks enough of the, of the airflow, if it's in the right spot, but other times uh, the veterinarian has to go in there and remove it, um, I guess with four sets many times is what my sister says, because she's a veterinarian. Uh, occasionally they have to go in and do a uh, little surgery uh, to get it out. And so it, it's an expense and, a, right. and a, of course, a big hassle and pain for the dog. And it's the risk of, of death or injury, right? Right. From, from what I understand uh, from having dogs around who swallow things sometimes, uh, they're not, it's not necessarily a death sentence if a dog swallows one, but it's certainly not a good idea. Right. Okay. And uh, so on the market, there are some bully stick holders, um, which uh, I, I'm guessing you've, you've been aware of some of the ones that are out there. But yours well, is, is quite different for, um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, and, uh, well, maybe you can explain a little bit how it works and how you came up with this, this really uh, this interesting design. Yeah, well, the whole goal was to, of course, come up with something that my dog couldn't defeat. And um, I knew that, that the things like uh, that used just the stretchy rubber on it wasn't going to work because uh, the dog could pull it out. In fact, I, I started out doing a whole bunch of experiments. Um, for a nice rubber ring, I actually bought in uh, some hockey pucks, <laughs> drilled out and turned it into a hockey puck donut, essentially, and then sliced it and sort of was trying to clamp it uh, with compressive force. And uh, my dog, Eva, kept um, pulling the chew out of it. So it's like, okay, that's not going to work, just the compressive force of the rubber. Um, I've seen the, uh, the ones that screw down, and, and it works like a compression fitting where it, it, uh, you're trying to screw um, a compressive force on it that, uh, that digs into the side of the chew. And right, like that's, I guess, I, like, like, the, my, like the bonehead one. Like the bonehead. And I, I actually never bought one because I didn't think it was going to work. It, it just looked like my dog would be able to pull it out. Because she was doing crazy things. Like I was taking the, the hockey puck version, and I was even putting – I was – deeply uh, countersinking them so she wouldn't hurt her teeth on it. But I was putting like wood screws, metal wood screws in there that was digging in about uh, an eighth of an inch into a rawhide to see how that would hold. And, and once the rawhide would soften a little bit as she got closer and it would start to get soggy, uh, she was able to rip it free because it was now soggy and that, just that little eighth of an inch of a wood screw wasn't enough to hold it. So I was like, okay, this is really something that my dog, which is a 60-pound doodle, 65-pound doodle, um, she's, she's defeating everything that I can come up with. Uh, so I totally gave up on any sort of just sheer compression. I was like, well, I have no choice. I have to drill a hole through the chew and put a pin through it. And that started a whole uh, series of experiments and designs and prototypes trying to figure out uh, what diameter the pin needed to be, what the uh, mechanism should be. Of course, the easiest one is you use a, uh, say, a nylon bolt uh, with, a, uh, with a nylon nut on the other end. And I actually made up a few like that, and she was able, uh, she was breaking my, the nylon bolt on those because it was a quarter-inch diameter nylon bolt, um, but, of course, you've got threads, which makes it a little bit thinner than a solid quarter inch because it's a bolt. And uh, she was able to uh, snap the nylon on those uh, and pop it free. 
I actually decided I like the idea of going through a hole to secure it because when it worked, it worked. The dog wasn't able to get it free. Um, but I didn't want something where it had threads because the threads would get damaged and you're sitting there trying with your fingers to screw things inside of a recessed plastic rubber thing and it was hard to reach and I didn't want to have to use a screwdriver. So that's where I came up with the whole sliding a nylon pin. So it's just a smooth nylon pin uh, with a head on it and then I needed some sort of latch mechanism that would hold it in place. And I started out with just rubber tabs um, that would kind of just catch the, the tip of the head of the, of the nylon pin. Um, and that would work mostly but because sometimes she would get down and she would just get at just the right angle where she's pulling on the chew and she happens to be pulling it in the direction of pin exit and it would slowly walk that pin out. I was like, okay, well, that's not going to work. And so um, that's why I came up with the design and the prototype you have where it has this nice, thick, black rubber uh, nylon, I call it the latch, and it holds the pin head, and you absolutely cannot push the pin out past that latch until you reach in with your finger and just swing the latch to the side. And now the pin's free, and the pin comes out. So it's a dual-action locking mechanism which can't be defeated by a dog because you have to move the latch on one side while you push the pin free on the other. If you just try to push the pin free, it won't come out. If you just move the latch to the side, nothing happens, and you let go of the latch, it goes right back into place. So it's double action, and the dog can't beat it. And so my dog has never defeated that latch mechanism. Um, so um, how would you describe to how, how it looks? Go ahead. How would you describe how it looks uh, to look, someone who hasn't seen it? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, uh, it's essentially think of a, of a rubber ring, um, and then it's just got a hole in the middle, which is where the chew goes. And then if you were to uh, lay the, the ring flat and drill a hole all the way through the, the body of the ring, across the cavity that's in the hole in the middle, and then out the other side, you know, have the, that's the path that the, that the latching pin slides on. And then on one end, uh, there's a rubber latch, which kind of like blocks, it's like a door. And so you push the pin past that black latch rubber door, which is, uh, it's a segment of, uh, black rubber, uh, extruded, uh, cabling is what it is. And it just hangs down and locks the pin in place. And so there's room for you to push it to the side, and now the pin can pop out free. How did you get into dog toy product development? Had you invent? Is this the first product that you've invented? <laughs> well, I am a uh, research scientist, a chemist by training. And you're based and in, in Austin, is that right? Yes, I'm down in Austin. And I get to do... Uh, science and technology. It's, you know, it's kind of like inventing R&D, and I enjoy it, but I've always, ever since I was a kid, wanted to be a garage inventor. I had an inventor's notebook as a kid, um, you know, all that sort of stuff, right, that, that you hear people like to do. And then, um, so since I've been in Austin, I've decided I like inventing in my garage, so I've pursued some other ideas uh, that uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, I like uh, came up with a tripod that had legs instead of that extend like a conventional tripod. They, uh, they're a tube of plastic and then they have a slit in it and so it rolls up flat, kind of like a really long flat bracelet. And uh, so the, the tripod rolled up and so I played around with inventing something like that. I came up with a hot melt glue gun that, uh, that there's a way that you could it would snap the glue string so that if a crafter, those glue strings get everywhere, that it would do that. And so I've all sorts of ideas that never really went anywhere. And uh, so I was thinking about the next thing I wanted to do, and my dog Eva choked. And I was like, well, I uh, looked at the what's on the market, and I didn't like everything out there. So I said, let me see if I can come up with something. And so I didn't. 
mean to just say, I'm going to go invent something for dogs. It was a point of necessity for me because uh, raw hides and uh, bully sticks and all sorts of chews were banned in our household after uh, a couple of choking incidents. And uh, uh, so I thought, well, let's see if I can come up with a, with a solution because the dog really loves them and I like giving them to her, but we're worried about choking. And uh, so it's just it just kind of happened. Uh, it was a project I started pursuing, and, and here's where I am now. So what were was your first step to research what else was on the market? Yes, it was looking and see what you could buy, and you know there was the the rubber sleeves and and stuff, and uh, like I said, I played around with trying to make my own and even making them stronger, and uh, didn't like them. Um, and so after, you know, that initial round of development, and I'm pursuing three or four different ideas uh, for products to chase at the same time. Um, it's like I need to pick one and kind of focus on it. And it's after doing the, like a market comparison and doing a, a few rounds of experiments, kind of a screening experiment, I said, well, this looks like it could go somewhere. I think I could come up with a solution for this. Uh, There's nothing out there on the market that appears to be undefeatable, and I want to make it undefeatable. That would be one of my goals. And um, and from what I saw about the dog market, you know, they say it's recession-proof because people go hungry, but they'll still buy their dog a toy (laughs) and stuff like that. Uh They're like, okay, that sounds good. Um, Maybe I can actually make some money for a change doing it. Uh, So uh, it just... Kind of then, I decided, okay, let's go so far. Let's pursue this this uh, anti-choking uh, chew holder idea. Now, one question that um, some of uh, some of my staff had about the product is, it has to be used with uh, bully sticks, or I understand you also use rawhide with it, um, or whatever right. you're using. Let's say bully sticks. Um, it has to have, the bully stick has to have a hole drilled into it. Uh, yes. Now, are you, is the idea that you would be selling bully sticks that have holes in it, or do you sell instructions on how to put a b- hole into a bully stick? Because, I mean, I, I guess I can imagine drilling into a bully stick to create a hole, but it, it's not an, anything yeah. I ever thought about doing before. <laughs> yeah. Well, on the on the Kickstarter campaign, we actually have options for both of, um, you can, uh, if you know how to use a 5 16th drill bit, which is all it takes, um, you can just real quick drill a hole through the bully stick. If the bully stick's big enough, it's got to be like a jumbo sized bully stick uh, in order to have enough well, girth to uh, have a hole drilled in it. Mm-hmm. So, um, so there's that, and then we're providing bully sticks uh, with, the, with the ring that already have the hole in it. And the goal is is that we would then work with our manufacturers uh, to provide the refills long term. Uh, so then, at that point, the consumer has the option of either buying their own bully sticks and, if they're comfortable, drilling their own holes, and I'm cool with that. Or if you don't want to, then you could just then go online and order an ever chew refill. Um, and I think that. Um, might be why some people are hesitant to purchase it because they're worried about us being around long term uh, and providing bully sticks for this toy, you know, beyond the initial Kickstarter campaign. Uh, I've got established relationships uh, with uh, Tasman's Natural for the rawhides. And so, in fact, at their plant, they were able to drill the holes for us and send me a box of around 100 prototypes that I've been using, and in fact, those are the ones that you got um, in yours, and then um, work with Crane Pets, uh, set up an agreement with them to be the provider for the rawhides, because they have really nice um, USA grass-fed jumbo-sized rawhides that they are drilling a hole, and it's real nice, and so for the Kickstarter campaign, I was going to handle drilling the holes with those, with those myself, and then work with uh, Preen to, to establish. Ideally, they would do that at their factory. Um, 
If not, we'd set up a middleman sort of system where they could get drilled out. It's, it's drilling the whole piece of cake. Okay, um, so it's so it's yeah, so it's is, not so hard. The idea is that you know someone could basically do this themselves without too much fanfare. If you have a drill and you have a drill, oh, I, drill bit, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, you just need uh, uh, the drill bit and a little uh, cordless drill, and uh, I can handle that. Yeah. <laughs> five, five seconds. Right. Now, um, have you learned anything about sourcing bully sticks as you've uh, been down this interesting path? Anything about what bully sticks? Sourcing. Have you learned anything about sourcing bully sticks? About bully oh, sticks, like where where good ones come from or what to look for? Because I know that's definitely a concern of my clients is uh, the quality of uh, the the bull penis that their dog is consuming. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I have learned quite a lot about the the different types of uh, not types of bully sticks, but how they're made and, and the, where they're made from. The difference between bully sticks and rawhides, of course, is bully sticks don't have to undergo as much treatment, which is why a lot of people like them uh, a whole lot better and feel that they're safer. Uh, right. Bully, uh, rawhides are usually dried and then bleached and flavored, et cetera, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. And bully sticks are pretty much just the bully stick. They, they do come in sort of two flavors, though. There's the ones that stress that they are uh, odor-free, which um, I know that in our household, the odor-free ones are preferred because if you get the odored kind, um, it smells like a urinal. <laughs> and my wife walked in the house with those, and she can smell it as soon as she steps in the front door. So she prefers the odor-free one. In my experience, uh, there's, no, there's the, really no such thing as an odor-free bully stick, though. They all have some sort of smell to but, them, but the the order the old odor free ones. How do they? How are they odor free? Are they dried for longer? Do they wash them? Well, what I've learned, <laughs> it's, it's the washing step. I believe if, as long as they get all of the um, the residual urea and related compounds uh, out of the bull penis uh, when it's still undried in its natural state. Um, I think if, as long as you wash it really well, that's the step at getting the odor out. And then past that, um, there's no real difference, I don't think. I've seen a lot of differences. I'm not sure why. Um, it, they've got the ones that are rolled up like twists and some that are knotted. But on the general ones that are straight, some um, look almost like a nice on a cross section, like an oval. And then other ones are, are very uh, indented and, and have really weird-shaped cross-sections. I don't know if it's just because that's the way the cow was hung or if that's the way that, uh, that due to some of them being dried vertically or being dried horizontally, I, I don't know the difference there. But they do come in, in a huge difference in sizes uh, or thicknesses. You've got the petites, regulars. <laughs> uh, then usually <laughs> thick. <laughs> The petite, the petite cow penis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess also yeah. one thing that's different about your product from other ones that I've seen is I guess that it could be used with like a, a curly bully stick, which come from the curly, yeah. the curly hung uh, bulls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the curls is natural, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, that's certainly an advantage. Okay. Well now tell me about how you're funding this. How have you, I, I'm curious to know how you funded it, how you have funded it so far and, uh, okay. and then what the next steps are and how long it's going to take for me to be able to sell these to my clients who I think are going to, uh, buy them up quickly. Well, the Everchu development project is all self-funded, right? It's just comes out of, uh, it's my hobby money more than anything. Uh, I don't play golf and I mountain bike a little, so I don't spend much money on that. Uh, so it's just my thing. And so everything up to this point has been funded um, with me fiddling around in the garage. Uh, but then to go into manufacturing, that's a big expense. And so you're looking at $10,000, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to have the molds cut for the injection molding. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then after the injection molding, you have to um, ha have enough money to have it made. You have uh, the pin; it also needs to be injection molded. 
and it has to be made. Um, so you have to have minimum quantities of making all of those. And so that's why I moved into uh, the Kickstarter type model where I was hoping that uh, I would raise the funds on Kickstarter, get enough, essentially pre-purchases on Kickstarter is the way it works. Uh, people are putting money down and anticipating in anticipation of delivery about two months away. What we're looking at is if we achieve our funding goal uh, on Kickstarter is that uh, we will be delivering the shoes uh, before Christmas. And so uh, if, if people celebrate holiday presents with each other, it'll be perfect for that. Um, so that's when delivery will be, and then we would be manufacturing enough, uh, more than just what the Kickstarter requires. We'd make enough that we would then be able to uh, su supply it uh, to retailers or on an online store or whatever model we're going to go with after that. We haven't completely nailed all that down yet. Uh, and what is... Sort of baby, baby steps. <laughs> um, what is your goal uh, with Kickstarter then? The goal on Kickstarter is to raise the, uh, it's a little bit over $18,000. We've been doing it just under a week, and we have uh, started out, we did a whole lot of pre-advertising to build up our contact list beforehand. So the majority of our advertising uh, was through Facebook, and we have built up an email response list and a messenger response list that were people that said that they were interested uh, and, you know, they clicked on it and entered their information. And so that when we launched, we uh, said, okay, we're launched. Uh, September the 4th was the day we launched. And so we sent out the email blast and the, and the messenger uh, blast to everybody and said, okay, it's time to, you said you were interested. Why don't you go visit and, uh, and make a pledge? And so we've had a, a whole lot of traffic landing on the page. Um, the difficulty that we're facing is that the traffic that's landing on the page isn't converting into pledges, and we're trying now to troubleshoot why. And I think part of the issue is the fact that it's the, they get there and they see the full video and they see that there's a hole going through the chew, and that kind of gives them a little bit of a pause, that they, they become concerned over how am I going to source this long term, and the thing is with the Kickstarter is I'm not a existing shoe manufacturer, you know, or a uh, existing toy company. I'm a, I'm a new guy, right? The new kid on the, on the block. And so I think they're concerned, even if I can build up their trust that I know what I'm doing and, and I've got all the manufacturing lined out and that I can make this thing and I can supply it. And when you give me 30 bucks, you'll get your 30 bucks worth of product. I think they're a bit concerned that they won't be able to buy refills long term. And so now they're stuck with something that needs a, a chew with a hole in it and they have no way of getting that chew with a hole in it. So I'm trying to figure out is that the issue we're facing with, with people committing to the Kickstarter campaign or is it something else that we're missing? Is it hopefully it's not like my accent or something? I can't do much about that. <laughs> Maybe you need to do a, a demo to show people how easy it is to drill a hole through a bully stick, which I'm, I'm saying it's easy. I assume it's easy. I haven't yeah. tried it yet, but I, I will try it. <laughs> no, you, you're absolutely right. That's And when we were talking earlier, that's something that we don't show. And it would be really easy to, I mean, it's a, Five second loop showing I'm drilling a hole for a chew. All right. Well, and we uh, maybe maybe we figured out the answer to the problem. <laughs> maybe that is. What are it. what are these going to be retailing for? Well, the retail price is for the ring itself. Uh, we have that nailed down around twenty, um, and then for the chews, we we folded in free shipping with everything. And so on the Kickstarter campaign itself, we have the early bird special of um, the ring and the rawhides for 29 and then the ring and the bully sticks for 34 Awesome. So do you have any other products in the works? I would love to come up with a way, uh, like the Everchew uh, 2, or the Everchew Pro would eventually be giving away from the, the hole to the pin. 
I don't know how I would do that. I'm not sure it's even possible because right now I've got something that's undefeatable and it's got the hole that, that goes through the chew. Uh, I'm now asking myself to develop a product that is still undefeatable without the hole. And, of course, it's, it's like without using metal and without using tools. And so I stack all these other requirements onto it. Um, I can see I can see how you could lose sleep over that. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I wish you a lot of luck with this one. I hope I hope the uh, Kickstarter campaign makes achieves its goal. And um, if there's I, anything I we can do at School for the Dogs to help, let us know because we're definitely eager to carry this and start uh, offering it to our clients. I'm looking for the bully of the town. Fun dog fact of the day, or perhaps weird dog fact of the day. While bully sticks, uh, aka bull penises, also sometimes called pizzle, uh, are not generally eaten in America, they are eaten in some other countries. I believe specifically in China, uh, there are some dishes made with, with bull penis. Um, but in 2014, a supermarket in Austin, Texas, which coincidentally is where Kirby is based, was sued by the state for trying to sell their customers raw packaged bull penis in the meat section as if it were for human consumption. They had arrived in a box that stated it was uh, not intended for sale as human food, but somehow uh, staffers at the supermarket repackaged it and relabeled it and uh, it got sold to some unsuspecting Texans. <laughs> um, and our woof shout out today goes to Disco. Disco, who has been mentioned before on this podcast, belongs to uh, My School for the Dogs co-founder, Kate Sinisi. He is an adorable, much-loved pitbull rescue with an epic underbite and a huge capacity for snuggling. I love him to death. Earlier this week, we received the sad news that he seemed to have some kind of inoperable tumors on his spleen and his heart. Uh, he's only about eight years old. A date was set to euthanize him. We were all incredibly heartbroken at school for the dogs. But then yesterday... Kate and her husband got a second opinion, and it doesn't seem like the situation is quite so dire. So although we're not sure how long Disco has, if it's a little time ahead or a long time, we are very glad that he is going to be with us for some more time because uh, we all need those snuggles, Disco. So big love to Disco and to Kate and her husband, Jared, who've had a very difficult week I love all three of you very much, and I only mildly dislike your cat. Special thanks to Kirby Kendall for taking the time to talk to me for this episode. His Kickstarter campaign, which I will link to in the show notes, runs through October 3rd. So go over there and contribute so you can get an early model of one of these things. Also, thanks to Alex Chris, who produces School for the Dogs podcast, and to Jazz Banjo Rex for his tune for this show, and to our sponsor, SaneBox. To talk a little bit about SaneBox, I've invited someone uh, I care a lot about, my husband, Jason, to tell me a little bit about his email habits. So, Jason. Yeah. Do you do you use uh, SaneBox to manage your email? No. You know that your wife has a podcast and uh, they sponsor her podcast. And if you go to schoolforthedogs.com slash sane, you can get a two-week trial and uh, $15 off. Really? Yeah, you don't know that because you don't actually listen to your wife's podcast, do you? Um, sometimes I'm <laughs> double speed. <laughs> double speed. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, tell me how you manage your uh, your email. Uh, I just use like a different browser tab for each of my inboxes, and I have a whole system. I have the 
unread emails show up first, and then a special starred section for emails I need to get back to, and then everything else. So everything else is like the stuff that's like important, but not super important, but not like spam? Yeah. Okay. Well, is there ever important stuff in that spot by accident? Sometimes, probably, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if you had SaneBox, you wouldn't have to have all of that part of your email. SaneBox sorts your email for you, so you don't have to do all the sorting. That's amazing. (laughs) So uh, for each of my email addresses, I have a separate person, uh, which I keep in a different browser. Um, Then inside my inbox... A separate person? Yeah, they're called people in Gmail. Oh, okay. You don't actually have a person who manages your email. No, uh, I do it all myself. I have I have a robot that manages my email. It's called SaneBox. So anyway, as I was saying, uh, I keep my unread emails first. Um, then I have my starred emails appear after my unread so I can star the ones I want to come back to. And then, last of all, the read emails show up. And I always read all my emails. And then when I check my email... I uh, turn each of my emails into tasks and write it in my Google Tasks bar. And then when my tasks build up, I copy and paste them all into Trello so I can organize my tasks and decide what I want to do first. That sounds complicated. It is, but it's also beautiful. (laughs) Wouldn't it be worth to spend a little bit of money every month and have a robot that could do all that for you? Uh, I hate admitting this, but you're probably right. (laughs) How many unread emails do you have in your inbox right now? About 100. All right. You know how many I have? How many? 10. You know why? Why? Because I use SaneBox. I love you. Love you too. Even if you don't listen to my podcast. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by telling your friends about it, leaving a review, or shopping in our online store. You can learn more about us and sign up to get lots of free training resources when you visit us online at schoolforthedogs.com. 